Well, thanks everyone for showing up first thing in the morning like this. I really appreciate it. So I, my, my talk is about the long lyric essay, and it actually has a longer title than what would fit in, in the program leaflet. The title of it is The Long and the Short of It, What the Guinness Book of World Records Taught Me About Writing the Lyric Essay. And I, I tend to write lyric essays. Sometimes they have a narrative thread, but usually um, they kind of accumulate meaning. So I, I want to talk about how I see both long lyric essays working and very short lyric essays working and the benefits and pitfalls of each. I'd like to start with the long lyric essay, then move into the short lyric essay, although I'll say right from the start that the more I think about these things, the more the actual importance of the word count fades. It's not so much the duration of the essay as the fact that the writer has imposed or created some kind of structure to contain the material. But first things first. A paperback cabinet of wonder, unlocking the long lyric essay. I'm thinking first about the challenges of the long lyric essay, which I'm defining as anything from about 40 pages to book length. For me, a lyric essay works like a poem can, with pressurized language and associative leaps. And although it may contain narrative, story is not the main engine pulling the reader through the material. And like a poem, the lyric essay can take a turn at the end, sometimes a sharp, surprising turn. But let's face it. No matter its length, the lyric essay presents challenges to the reader as well as to the writer. Narrative is a powerful tool to discard. And the language in a lyric essay can be dense, concerned with sound as well as with meaning. The pleasures of the lyric essay, the unhurried delight it takes in surprise and thought, can turn too easily into its downfall. Syntax can tangle. Lines of thought turn self-indulgent. This is prose of the kind that Robert Coover called disruptive, eccentric, even inaccessible. I love that. It is my goal in life to become disruptive, eccentric, and even inaccessible. But I believe that despite its challenges, the long lyric essay can provide a space for the reader and the writer <coughs> to delight in each other. In thinking about this question, I've been reading critic Tom LeClaire's book, The Art of Excess in which he discusses prose that makes a quantitative deformation of conventions, something I believe the lyric essayist sets out to do, consciously or not. Even more important for the terms of my argument, Leclerc cites key points from Roland Barthes' The Pleasure of the Text. Did you know you're going to get some Barthes on this conference? Bonus points, you get some Barthes on this conference. Barthes defines the text of pleasure as the text that contents, fills, grants euphoria, the text that comes from culture and does not break with it is linked to a comfortable practice of reading. But the text of pleasure differs from the text of bliss, which imposes a state of loss, discomforts, perhaps to the state of a certain boredom, unsettles the reader's historical, cultural, psychological assumptions, the consistency of his tastes, values, memories, and brings to a crisis his relation with language. How can bliss coexist with a state of loss, discomfort, and boredom? How can bliss bring to a crisis one's relation to language? Barth says we want to be shaken, challenged when we read. If that's right, then the long lyric essay must strive to be a text of bliss. In order for this text of bliss to succeed, I believe that the long lyric essay demands a strong narratorial presence to draw the reader's attention to and make meaning from what would seem like bare facts. More. The lyric essay's images must startle, if its juxtaposition surprise while feeling inevitable. Briefly, three models for the kind of long lyric exploration I want to do in my own work. Two are nonfiction and one is poetry. Each example, longer than the last, depends on something other than narrative to bind it together. And each one reaches some kind of resolution. So, my first example, Joan Didion's essay, The White Album. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Clocks in at about 12,500 words. It depends on shape, but even more on an intensely hermetic sense of time, the late 1960s. The air is close, the entrance is sealed shut. In 15 sections, the narrator leads us through the Manson murders, campus riots, 
and music culture. When the end comes, there's no easy conclusion, but there is a sense of resolution with callbacks to previous images. But what holds the piece together? The narrative arc of the Manson case is part of it. The narrator's grip on herself is part of it. The persona of the narrator herself is part of it, but that's too easy. The narrator resists the notion that any simple answer could come of all this. As the last line says, writing has not yet helped me to see what it means. The essay might resist easy meaning, but it still satisfies. Why? Of course, Didion's sentences are lovely, and I find her steely narrator to be very sympathetic. But there's something more at work here. Could it be the physicality of her details? A lit match in Jim Morrison's black vinyl pants, the smell of jasmine in a crumbling tennis court, juxtaposed with the unanswerable questions of her time, a time that more and more, with its violence and dread, reminds me of ours. When the narrator first hears of the Manson killings, she says, I also remember this and wish I did not. I remember that no one was surprised. Didion's essay demonstrates one of what I believe to be the lyric essay's natural strengths. While clearly art, it feels more realistic than a strictly plotted narrative would. And with that strength, a question follows. Is this a peculiarly postmodern form, fixated on fragments? Not for me. I appreciate its affinity for fragments because oftentimes that's what we find. A shard of pottery, a few words of chalk graffiti. But I want the reader to have an intellectual and emotional payoff at the end. If not a conclusion, then a resolution. And Didion's essay provides that. My second example is Anne Carson's Very Narrow, Just for the Thrill. People read that essay? It's smoking. Go read that essay. It's really good. Very narrow, just for the thrill. It's in plain water. It clocks in at about 15,000 words. Here, two shapes corset the material. The first shape, told via travel diary, is that of a cross-country drive and camping trip the narrator takes with her soon-to-be former lover, a scholar of Chinese wisdom. The second shape is a list of places with names such as Crossfire Zone, Ten Heart Hermitage, and Flesh and Blood Bridge, mentioned on a historical map made by a royal courtesan in 1553. There are 67 items on the map list. There are 67 sections in the travel diary, by the way, unnumbered, so you have to go back and figure all this out yourself. Sneaky. Matching each item from the map with its corresponding entry in the travel diary provides sparks of meaning. Like a terrific last line in a poetry collection, the map slingshots you back into the beginning so that you reread the piece with a new revelation in mind. As an example, I'd like to read section 58 in the travel diary. By this point, the relationship is deteriorating between the narrator and her lover. They're also passing through Las Vegas, which surely isn't helping. <laughs> Las Vegas, Nevada. On the radio, someone is interviewing Ray Charles. When I do a song, I like to make it stink in my own way, Ray Charles is saying. With eyes closed, I can smell the fickle dow of Las Vegas heating up in layers. We seem to be driving through the center of town, to judge from the frequency of stops. Traffic intersections smell like under fur of dogs. Raw liver as the humans wash past, hot, cold, hot. Neon smells like shock treatment and makes that same ice pick nick on your mind. I remember on the eve of my 13th birthday, I overheard my aunts talking to father about young girls and the dangerous age. But she isn't going to be one of them. I heard father say firmly. I was filled with pride, which smells like rubies. I got seven nights to rock, Ray Charles is singing. Got seven nights to roll. His voice smells like wood and rain. Who will I be instead is a question I never got around to asking father. Every night I'm gonna show my face with a different chick in a different place. Well, I suppose I can be anyone I like, or rather, with eyes closed, nobody at all. A dream dreamt in a dreaming world is not really a dream, says classical Chinese wisdom, but a dream not dreamt is. The corresponding map item from Curtis and Lady Chang's list reads Bridge of Just Tears, which is preceded by number 57, Straight Road, and followed by 59, 
stations of refreshment for travelers on the straight road. I'm struck by the ways in which the polyvocality within the essay, as here with the Ray Charles quotes, lines from blues song singers are spread throughout the piece, is underscored by the map list at the essay's end, a kind of phantom doubling or recasting of the events that take place within the essay's 67 sections. Carson's essay demonstrates the second natural strength of the lyric essay. It allows the writer a space in which to make meaning out of events and sensations and thoughts it would be easy to overlook. This too matters, says non-narrative nonfiction, which creates meaning through accretion. I think of the marine worms, this is appropriate for being in this building, no? The marine worms who live in the shallow waters off the Gulf Coast, collecting bits of broken shell and seaweed and cast off crab claws and barnacle flakes. With these, they knit long socks in which they encase their soft bodies. Every piece is a necessary part of the disguise and the armor. The chips are no good on their own, but only as assembled. My last example is A.R. Ammons' book-length poem, Garbage. Part of what ties this book together is the act of writing itself, as in lines where the narrator calls our attention to the process. How to write this poem. Should it be short, a small popping of duplexes, or long, hunting wide, coming home late, losing the trail, and recovering it? The narrative voice is pleasingly unsure of itself, and this self-questioning feels right for the non-narrative, non-mastering modus operandi of the piece. But more than that, the narrator himself ties the poem together. He's clearly present from the beginning, with his musings on soybeans, departmental meetings, and trips to the farmer's market. And here I see a third natural strength of the long lyric, the particular pleasure it takes in rigorous language. Each word and its placement count. It comes to its conclusion in its own good time, and its realizations bubble along, almost subterranean, until they break upon the reader, who seems to get it at the same time the narrator does. An odd thing happens when I read the poem's last lines with their gesture toward the superlative. The gentlest, the most refined language, so little engaged it is hardly engaging, deserves to tell the deepest wishes, roundabout fears. Loud boys, the declaimers, the deaf listen to them. To the whisperers, even the silent, their moody abundance. The poem that goes dumb holds tears. The gentlest, the most refined. I'm struck here by our longing to define the outer limits of something, an urge that comes on us early in life and sticks with us. As evidence of this, let me present the book fair of my memory. Concrete Elementary School in Anderson County, South Carolina. We lined up with dollar bills. Our mothers had paper clipped to the order forms to buy the Guinness Book of World Records. <laughs> Even though it was chunky as a dictionary, you could read the Guinness book straight through. At lunchtime, we read it aloud, savoring the things people thought up to do and the fame their odd success brought upon them. And even now, staring at the Guinness homepage, I'm hooked. Here's a man towing an airplane. Here's the world's largest collection of sick bags. Here's the statistic for the fastest mile covered on spring-loaded stilts. <laughs> Says Ammons, anything, anything, anything is poetry. Okay, here's the most toilet seats broken by the head in one minute, 46. He was from Indianapolis. We want to push the limits. Here's proof, a long list poem doubling as the book most stolen from bookstores, unless that's the Bible. It's a book of wonders a paperback cabinet of curiosity. Writes Ammons, we're trash, plenty wondrous. Should I want to say in what wonder consists? It is a tiny wriggle of light in the mind that says, go on. That's what it says. That's all it says. Reading Guinness alongside Ammons, I'm attracted again to the prose Coover calls disruptive, eccentric, even inaccessible. Disruptive. Yes. Eccentric, certainly yes. 
But these two qualities need not lead to inaccessibility. Isn't that life? Isn't it the text of bliss? What challenges the reader, upends her expectations, forces her to recast her assumptions in a new frame. Walk with me through the art of excess. Past the house in the desert made of old green bottles, chinked with mud and glowing in the sun. Past the fabulous show costumes Liberace wore, glittering and glistering with several oceans worth of factory made shine. Right on up to the big sphere that lives in its own glassed in house, audacious and disruptive and strange. The biggest ball of twine made by one man in Darwin, Minnesota. Are you there with me? Do you feel it? Do you see it? There it is, the biggest ball of twine. It's amazing. Yes. The biggest ball, they say, weighs nine tons, is 40 feet around, and took 29 years to make. I have seen it. And I can tell you this. It's tall as corn in August of a good year. It pulls dust to itself, smells like mice, and started with a yard or so of leftover baling twine. He twisted it around two fingers and tied it into a knot to save. By and by, the saving of it became more important than anything else. This, too, is a text, a memorial. I think of Barth again. To examine it brings discomfort, perhaps to the state of a certain boredom. It unsettles the consistency of the reader's tastes, values, and memories. It brings to a crisis one's relation with language. I stood before it and knew not what to say. <laughs> Says Ammons, we mean to go on and go on till we unwind the winding of our longest road. No matter how closely you look, you can't find the place where he stopped. The end is like the beginning, and there's a long, long line between. So that's the first part. That's the long lyric essay. You want to stand up and stretch for a minute? Stand up. Stand up. Come on. Rise. Rise all. Oh, it's morning time. The only thing better than thinking about Barth and the long lyric is thinking about the short lyric. That's right. That's right. Good, good, good. Okay. So, so much for the long lyric. Now we move on to the short lyric. The acorn and the snow globe. The short essay. An exploration in four parts. Part one, limits. I want to begin with a more or less arbitrary word count, 750. This is the limit that Brevity Magazine uses. And by the way, if folks want to read some terrific short nonfiction, <laughs> check it out, Brevity Mag. I like it because it gives the writer enough elbow room to explore something, but forces some choices too in terms of diction and usually scope, although not always. I'm focusing on word count here as a conscious marker, deciding to circumvent or even deform, as our old friend, the literary critic Tom LeClaire might say, conventional reader expectations, which say that a serious essay ought to weigh in at about 5,000 words. Why write a short essay? Is it brevity for its own sake? Although that could be enough, I want to emphasize that catering to the reader's supposedly ever-shortening attention span is not what I'm after. An arbitrary limit, whether it's 740 words or 140 characters, can't be all there is to this question. Still, let's start with the word count, a natural place to begin. There's something odd about the very short essay, even a little freakish, like the feats collected in the Guinness Book of World Records. When the book fair came, I remember we all lined up to buy it, and we weren't the only ones. Today, online reviews of the book say things like, one of the first books I bought with my allowance. And my parents had this book in their library. I read it cover to cover, twice as a child. Why? Why? I have no idea. Guinness is a wonder cabinet of a book, crammed with delights. Like this. The most tennis balls held in the mouth by a dog. <laughs> Five, by Augie, a golden retriever in Texas. That's right. Or, heaviest weight lifted by tongue. Uh-huh. Or this, one of my favorites, loudest purr by domestic cat. <laughs> Smokey achieved its record in its home where it felt relaxed and happy. Accessories used during the record attempt include a grooming brush, 
slices of ham, and stroking by hand. These facts compel me, not because they're short, although they are, but because they're particular. You can get your head around them, even if you'd never think to do them yourself. Said one online reviewer, I used to read these sorts of books every night before turning the light off, wondering if I would ever set a world record myself. What contagious ambition. Something about the book makes you want to discover the one thing you could do better than anyone else in the world, a goal made up of equal parts hubris and humility. Could you be the world record holder for the moats plates broken by one finger in one minute? Well, we want to push things to the limit. So too, the very short essay pushes the limit of the form. It's a snapshot, neatly framed, but within that frame, something must pull the reader in and hold her tight. Part two, strengths. To get down to particulars, what does the short essay do well? For one thing, the form is good at concise investigation, whether that's of a brief story with a larger resonance, a clear image, especially one that the writer places in historical or future time, or a compressed sketch of place. Ultimately, I believe this is a formal consideration. Why decide to write in a circumscribed form? What are the natural strengths of a short essay? First, the short essay can show its parentage clearly. Its mother, a Polaroid, its daddy, a song. Within that compressed frame, the writer has license to push the language harder than she might in a longer piece, with even more unusual word choices, syllabics, rhyme, allusion. The short essay can be a rich morsel, more saturated than a long piece could sustain, and it can be closely related to poetry with the added space that prose provides. This is really what I love about the lyric essay, how it rips off the good things about poetry but gives you the added space. Good stuff. Secondly, there's an urgency about the short essay. As a friend said to me recently, you can see the short essay's end from its beginning, so it's apocalyptic by nature. There's a compelling dualism here. The mushroom cloud rises for two minutes after detonation, yet the fallout lingers for 12,000 years. In the same way, the short essay can stay with you for a long time. Third, the short essay, by virtue of its brevity, draws attention to its artifice. In order to stay short, it must elide much of the deliberation that went into its making. The result is cleaner and leaner than it has any right to be. It has to be. There is no room to spare. The revision it demands results in the inaction of emotion recollected in tranquility. The more or less strict form, say 750 words, draws attention to the piece as art, a made thing. Finally, the short suits the fragment well, and often the fragment is all we can save. Charles Simmons' essay, Three Fragments, an excellent example of this, appears in the anthology titled In Short, edited by Judith Kitchen and Mary Pomier Jones. And here's a seeming contradiction. Although brief, the short essay need not hurry. For it, too, the pleasures of slow examination and rumination the turning of a thing over and over in one's hands. For it, too, the earned realization, and this is one way in which the short essay surpasses Guinness's list of odd facts. The essay can still try to create meaning from those facts, to reach for some kind of resolution. And the short essay's realization only seems to be modest. It aims to convince you Yes, but also to invite your rereading, to slide your eyes along its lines again, so that it begins to worm your, its way into your memory, even. Something like a song, a well-written pop song, indelible. That'll be the day when you say goodbye. Yes, that'll be the day when I die. Part three, pitfalls. We know that brief can carry plenty of meaning. See the Gettysburg Address, famously 272 words long. And as in an epitaph, the brief can endure. But along with its benefits, the short form carries with it a major risk, that of feeling slight. As always, the writer must answer the so what question. If not, the reader may say, with justification, who cares? 
And I think the solution to this problem is to examine whatever you're writing about in a dynamic, non-static way. For example, look at the short essay Ferdinand and Maricela by Bruce Berger, which was also reprinted in the InShort anthology. In this essay, the narrator pours over a found photograph and wonders about the figure and the inscription there. He imagines a life for the woman, imagines a story. He places her in context, and some of this context he must admit is based on hunch, which I would say is fine in nonfiction as long as you signal that's what you're doing. And as in the Guinness Book, the particulars make the essay work. Here's the moment when he first finds the photograph in the terrific heat of the Arizona desert at noon. I reached carefully between the barbs of fallen choya, tweezering it out between thumb and forefinger. I unfolded it once, then again. An inch and a half square unfurled, it was a portrait of a girl against a neutral backdrop, snapped in a cheap studio, or perhaps a machine. In her late teens, with full but sad features, she gazed into the lens with moist dark eyes, black lashes, black eyebrows, and dyed blonde hair. On the other side, in schoolgirl cursive, she'd written in Spanish, Fernando, though you're far away, don't feel alone, for there is one who remembers and will wait for you always. Berger's description here is so nuanced, it feels like an ekphrastic poem something that's written about a larger piece of art. It enacts the picture on the page, and even more important, reveals the narrator by showing what he sees and what he examines. Once he shows us the photograph, he interrogates its details, and by doing so, overcomes the potential pitfall of the static. Maricela's snapshot would have fit neatly in a plastic leaf, and perhaps it had. Yet it had been doubled and quartered so that her face was disfigured by the crosshairs of the folds as if by a rifle sight, leaving the tiny quadrangle more unwieldy than before. Maricela hadn't been lost. She'd been freshly and consciously discarded. Here he's sleuthing out a possible scenario for how the photograph came to be where he found it. In so doing, he creates a possible past for the figure, but doesn't stop there. By the end of the essay, the narrator addresses Maricela directly. Maricela, it is over a decade since a passing gringo, stunned by the heat, rescued your photo from beneath the cactus. You were right to let your hair grow dark, to embark on adulthood, to forget the worthless Fernando. After high school, your friends married and began families, or became shop girls, or sold themselves in the streets to Fernando's cronies from across the border. Nogales is not a town where jilted girlfriends pine by the casement, nor were you the Lady of Shalott. Fernando has doubtless pursued the construction dollar and begun a family with another person, probably not blonde. He no longer worked with the lady who built custom homes, for she's died. The cactus she left between her constructions has filled with other homes, and her name is kept fresh only by a street sign. The desert is less and less able to keep what we throw away and your photo barely preceded the bulldozer. But if you ever feel alone in your new life as a mother, a salesperson, a streetwalker, remember that there is someone far north of Nogales, far north of Tucson, who is unaccountably haunted by your eyes and who keeps your photograph within reach for solace in the night. I'm struck here by the amount of physical and emotional ground Berger is able to cover in these last two paragraphs. Not all of his narrator's questions can be answered. He's unaccountably haunted by her eyes. And from a craft standpoint, it seems useful to let that mystery stand. Part four, conclusion. There is pleasure to be taken in the small. The nut brown acorn in which a great tree curls. The snow globe with its tiny skaters on a lake ringed by woods. I think of another cross genre master of the small form Joseph Cornell, visual artist, creator of box constructions. Their frames are modest. You can hold them in your hands. They have a human scale. They seem humble. He made his boxes out of things he found in junk stores. Blue sand, steel rings, scraps of old maps, pharmacy bottles. And with them, he created new worlds under glass. Cornell's work inspired me while I was working on my first book of essays, The Wet Collection. 
which contains many short pieces as well as some essays of traditional length. Like Cornell, I was interested in the ways in which proximity forces relationship. Blue mirrors and swan feathers might not seem to go together, but once linked in a box or a sentence, their kinship feels inevitable. And like Cornell, I was reassured by the idea of the small. The short form is inviting, hopeful. It seems deceptively manageable. As the online reviewer said about the Guinness Book, I used to read it every night before turning the light off, wondering if I would ever set a world record myself. In conclusion, I'd like to mention a quote by Bruce Springsteen. You know, the boss. Let's hear it for the boss. Let's hear it for the boss. That's right. That's right. That's right. It's still only 9.30. The boss. In an interview with the New York Times, he spoke of planning his set for the 2009 Super Bowl halftime show. Springsteen said, it was very challenging to try to get those exact 12 minutes. I found it in a funny way, it was very freeing. Okay, these are your boundaries, so put everything that you have into just this box. If you do it right, you should feel the tension of it wanting to spread beyond that time frame, but it can't. You should feel the tension of it wanting to spread beyond its time frame, he said. So the frame itself is part of the essay. Impose a frame on the material. 750 words, no more, no less. Within that, there's more than meets the eye. Something about a well-written short essay suggests more than the sum of its parts. Like the old folk tales that speak of palaces tucked away in lean-tos, or the second world hidden behind the looking glass. One last image, the world's most tattooed man. He has inked 99% of his body Yes, 99%. <laughs> Covering himself with leopard spots on a ground of yellow. His body is of necessity a limited canvas. But within that, he goes full tilt. Look him over and you can't forget him. He's made himself indelible. Something about the way he meets your eye feels like forever. You can't help looking just one more time. Thank you. Yeah. You want questions, comments, discussions, thoughts? Controversy, yes. What was the name of the burger? That was Ferdinand and Maricela, and it's in In Short, which is a wonderful an anthology. Kitchen and Jones, the editors. Say that again, please. In Short, and the editors are Kitchen and Jones. Really terrific. Teaches well, too. Yeah. Could you talk to the overlap, if any, between journalism and a short essay? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I have, I've tried to do this in my own work. I think some of it, some of it depends on what your goals are in, in writing it. Um, I, I wrote a piece last summer um, for the Oxford American for their new South Journalism piece, and that's the closest thing I think I've done lately to journalism. But it, it's about the man who's the traveling scissor sharpener and he goes all over South Carolina, also North Carolina and Georgia. He's got this van, it says Scissor Man on the front, and he goes around and, I mean, it's particularly beauty shops. That's his specialty. And you can see why, because their scissors are very spendy, you know, $600, $700. Anyway, they're precious to people um, because they work with them for 20 years. So I, I wrote about that, and that was really more of a, of a lyric than a journalism piece, because it's not like, I don't know, <sighs> Was it news? No, but um, it was. <laughs> Sorry, this is not a great answer to your question. I, I think that, that there can be some overlap, but there is maybe usually not much. I don't think most newspapers would have the patience for the kind of revision I want to do. They're too time sensitive, and I understand that. Yeah, Jennifer. I was trying to skip you quite a bit. Uh huh. A much better answer, well, yes. No, yeah. it's not a better answer. No, it is, it is. But it's, it's related to the question I want to ask, which is, of course, a, a, what a 472-page lyric uh -huh. essay that is also uh, journalistic. 
I think it depends. I think it depends. I think sometimes you have a real story and sometimes the story comes in what you make of it and um, you're kind of coming to terms with with an event or an image or something you can't quite make sense of. Um, and I, I like the lyric essay for that but I think it also gets at the heart of what we what we're about when we try to make art out of lived life because the essay comes to replace the event that you're describing, even in your own mind. People have had this experience. If you write about something, that new thing comes to replace whatever the old thing was. But maybe maybe these events are so um, so transitory, this is the only way we can save them. I think I think that. Yeah. And it's the only way you can share it with anyone else too. Yeah. Let us now praise famous men. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if you structure your essays before you write them, or if that just happens more or less. I don't structure them before I write them, um, because for me, more energy comes from kind of following it and not really planning it out too much. It's that other part of the brain. But then when I revise it, as I will do compulsively 35 or 40 times, then I, I structure it to where it will take the reader also through it. So it's not only for me. But I, for me, it's important early on to, to not have a real plan and just kind of follow the heat of it. Yeah. Who would you list as influences on yourself? What's five, six authors? Well, I love Ann Carson, although I don't always get it. I will admit that. Um, I, I love Annie Dillard because of the way that, that she pays so much attention to what she's looking at. Um, in fiction, I love Annie Prue. That woman can write a sentence. I mean, the Malachite Mountains, you guys all know this. That's some damn good stuff. And every word matters. I think every word should always matter, but um, I've I figured out about myself that I like style a lot. It can't only be style, but I really like I really like attention to sentence making. Um, just finished Jennifer Egan's *Visit from the Goon Squad*. Did you guys read that? That was a great book too. Makes me want to go write a novel. And of course, I love *Moby Dick*. Who doesn't? <laughs> Ambitious. Any, any poet? Well, yes. I love *Garbage*. Um, Seamus Haney. Again, a, a lot of a lot of attention to language. That's that's the thing I would rip off of all the poets is that attention to language always. Andrew Hudgens, do people read him? I like him a lot. Andrew Hudgens, it's in Cincinnati now. No, Columbus now. Yeah. Does uh, the essay either the short or the long? Does it always have to deal with something that I think, or you know, in terms of like encountering something? And can it be sort of a fictional? Give me, give me an example of well, what you mean. I mean, just off the top of my head, I mean, mm -hmm. let's say, like, um, uh, Borges, mm -hmm. you know, writing about, like, a, a fictional review of, um, of a uh, novel, like, I don't know, I'm just thinking of an approach to love, and that's it, I don't know, that. but, you know, something where it's like a, it's like a review of something mm -hmm. that is not an actual You know, for myself, I feel that is okay as long as I signal to the reader that's what I'm doing. And 
this is another thing that I like to rip off from fiction, and this is why essays are great, because you can borrow from every genre. There have been things in my life that I will never know the answers to. Everyone has this experience, and so sometimes I, I, I have to, to move into what if. I wonder if. What if my grandmother had X, Y, and Z? What was her life like? I don't know. And I, I can make my best guess, and I can get some good details, and I, you know, I know where she lived and what it was like there and what some of the rhythms of life in that place were like. And I think I can draw on that, but the important thing is I have to signal to the reader that I'm making this move into fictionalized territory. I think it's okay as long as I'm not trying to fool anybody. But we can argue about that. Who wants to argue? Who wants to make a controversy? Yeah, I guess I, I would wonder, uh, unless you're bragging, unless mm -hmm. you're talking about claiming something that you've done, mm -hmm. what does it make of it true or not? We have dreams. We don't, we, mm -hmm. Who the hell knows what's true? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what well, you just said, it. once you write it, it replaces it. Right. Well, suppose you rewrote it again. And yeah. So why do we all, all of us worry about whether it's true or not? You know, to me, I tell a lot of stories, and everybody knows they're not true. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you change them on Tuesday from Monday. Yeah, yeah. Because, so because, it is all this. Because, they, because they know you, they know their narrator, and, and they, know, they know how to take what you say. So Responses to this? Well, I don't think it's right to try to fool people. But maybe it's because I'm a Capricorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do other people think? Yeah. Well, if some things that are nonfiction are about her, it's that they're at least mostly true. And even if the person is lying to themselves and telling them a story, you're believing that they believe their story. So, like, if you read the Guinness Book of World Records and everything in there is really just fabricated, that people can really read it. Whether that's worse is a different story, but like, it is different. So, to call something signal, like, is it true that you can never really remember dialogue identically to how it was said, so you should be signaling that this is, like, I understand the idea, like, this is where I'm going into fictional or mm -hmm. imagined territory, I imagine my grandmother, I imagine my right. father being said this or that, is that necessary, because like, obviously economy of words is crucial in a lyric essay, a short one, so, like, how, does that, how do you use dialogue in? I, I think you can. Yeah, I, I think you can still use dialogue in a short lyric essay and stay honest, and you just pick out the parts that are crucial. It would, it, in a way, it would, would follow the same principle as anything you put in a short lyric essay. Like it absolutely has to be there. And you're using it because you like the pattern of speech or it says something crucial about the other <coughs> character, and you don't include anything that is boring or extraneous. I, yeah, I, I think it's totally still possible. Yeah. This may be the last question. We should wrap up. Last question. I think if the author admits it, it's okay. I have a real problem with people making up stuff and passing it off as nonfiction and not signaling it to the reader because I think that's snookering and we don't snooker people. For instance, you can't make up numbers and say, I like the rhythm of that number better. I think that's cheating. I think that's cheating. But I think if you are trying to do the best you can and you enter into it with that in mind, I think that's different. I mean, like, if there is a verifiable fact and I can verify it, and let's say it's 32, and I put 33 because I like the sound of 33 better. I feel, for me, I mean, everyone has to decide this individually, but for me, I feel that's, that's not legitimate. Yeah. 
because it is, it is provable and you're making it up. However, if there are things that you cannot know, like what your grandmother's life was like in 1940, you ask people who knew her then if you can. You try to sift through the old documents if you can find them, any letters. Maybe you read old newspapers to get a general sense of what life was like. I was a history major, you can tell. Um, you go and you visit the place, and then from there you make your best guess and signal that you're making your best guess. I think that's different. But everyone must decide this for herself. Thanks so much. Thank you.